Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. This is a weekly podcast for anyone who loves The Simpsons, or ever has loved The Simpsons, hosted by two dudes that grew up on The Simpsons. My name is Miles, better known as Mr. Most Days Off, and today we are kicking off a brand new season of The Simpsons. We are diving into 13, uh, lucky number for us, and in an appropriate fashion, we're going to start off, as most seasons do, it seems, uh, with Treehouse of Horror 12 today. Uh, but of course, when I say we, joining me now for 12 past seasons and beyond, your co-host with the most, Richie the Whiz Kid. How you doing today, Rich? I just flipped over to the script and I was gonna, I was happy to talk about this episode starting off, but now I'm upset after I read the air date of, of this script uh, or of the episode because I remember that you did it. This is when it's starting to play after Halloween. So I know it's Miles' bit, but it's like the sixth day of November when this aired. And I remember that I was always so upset because I wanted to see it like before Halloween, like the week of Halloween. Um, So now I'm upset, man. Now I'm upset, but that's okay. Um, This was a fun episode, and I don't always speak highly of the Halloween episodes because, you know, they're so offshoots. Um, But yeah, I've got some things to talk about on this one. I guess I should quit rambling and throw mm-hmm. it back to you, the man, the myth, the flaming jerk. It is Miles. <laughs> I uh, I thought you just saw that there was no chalk gag and you were just really upset about it. At first. <laughs> no, that, it is weird that they always do the uh, Halloween episodes. It seems like at least a few days in this case, literally a week or very close to a week after Halloween. But I think it's just because. Their season starts in November, and I mean, if they don't do it then, they wouldn't have the real chance to do it. So I I get it, but I also, uh, I also feel what you're saying, where it's kind of like, especially when you're in the moment. At this point, it's almost like rubbing the fact that Halloween still like isn't around anymore in my face. I'm I'm like Mm -hmm. six days into getting over the fact that I am as far as I can be from my favorite holiday, and you're like, by the way, Halloween isn't for a whole nother year. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with that, but <laughs> and they could they could play it like a a week early and then just have a week where there's no episode if they really wanted to like have it. It could be like you know some shows do Christmas specials where even though the show isn't playing that time of year, they'll have a Christmas special. I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy did it recently, even though I haven't ever watched it, uh, or mm-hmm. they might be filming that now. So like you can have a one offshoot and then you know have the gap until the season starts if you really wanted to. Just saying. That's reasonable. I uh, I don't know how that works in terms of like the Fox network, if they were able to like, you know, make that happen with their scheduling contracts and other the stuff. The Simpsons but... is the Fox network. <laughs> I mean, on honestly, now. to some extent uh, for a while, that was definitely true. I think it was built yeah. on the back of like the Simpsons and married with children there for, for quite a little <laughs> while. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say the commentary on this one featured uh, showrunner Mike Scully, Joel Cohen, Ian Maxstone Graham, Carolyn O'Mine, Matt Selman, at, I'm sorry, Al Jean, John Frank, and Don Payne. Uh, Multiple and, guests of the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. That's true, actually. Uh, there's also two guest stars on this one, Matthew Perry and Pierce Brosnan, though they got two nice. very, very different uh, lengths of roles. Matthew Perry was like <laughs> there for one line to the point that I actually missed it the first time somehow I watched this episode and was like, really? And I am DV. I'm like, how, where was Matthew Perry in this episode? I don't know if I just like, like read something or smoked or whatever, but like, <laughs> uh, I just completely missed his line read whenever I was, uh, watching it the first time. Like, I mean, for this podcast, probably not when I was, when I was, uh, younger watching it. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what the commentating has to say about, the guest stars because it sounded like Pierce Brosnan had a whole lot of fun doing this just from the outside looking in. I'll say this: they really didn't have a lot to say. They had very, they had some interesting things to say, but very little of them. But each segment, Aww. I have at least a couple things, and and definitely at least something about Pierce Brosnan. I'm I'm sure. Actually, to start out, I will say that uh, that the role was actually originally offered to Sean Connery, of course, the original <laughs> James Bond. Uh, and then somehow it got offered to Lyle Lovett uh, and ended really? up winding up back with uh, Pierce <laughs> Brosnan. So it's just kind of interesting that like their initial offer started with a James Bond and then it ended up on another James Bond. I just think that Pierce has like the the calmness in his voice. Like I, it would be a completely different role of Sean no, Connery. Don't take it. away my British charm. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, also it, it almost makes it more the, terrifying that way, too. Yeah, his calmness, the the fact that there isn't any uh, aggression in him. It's very, like, civil, uh, gentlemanly, almost, uh, as yep. he's trying to murder Homer. <laughs> I, 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 I can see that as being creepy, for sure. Uh, I'll also say on IMDb, the only other, there's two other notes. Uh, one is that Matthew Perry is the second main cast member of the sitcom Friends, uh, after Lisa Kudrow to be a guest star on the show. Uh, and this is interesting. I don't really feel like this was basically they just literally listed on IMDb trivia that this episode aired after 9-11. I mentioned on the last uh, last episode that we recorded that that was in the trivia as well, that when we return to the show now, uh, we would be talking about a post 9-11 world. And I will say that uh, I'm surprised about how much 9-11 was discussed in the commentary. Uh, and uh, it's going to be discussed on this podcast more than you might expect uh, from a Simpsons podcast about a Halloween show or a Halloween episode of a Simpsons episode. You know what I mean? Uh, long story short, I have a 9-11 theory that I'm going to talk about with Harry Potter. And the commentary also had a lot of talk about 9-11. So that's going to be uh, part of today's discussion. Just a heads up. Oh, I guess I'm for some reason, you know, it's literally 9-11. I was thinking it was a different time of the year. But yeah, I guess this is less than two months after that happened so that's but then i guess the recording would be years after that so uh, it's too much time travel going on here miles it's kind of weird yeah it is it's an interesting thing to think about and it's it's something that uh at the time and even now and and everybody talks about just how much that changed the world and i think like this is one of those weird ripples where uh, the Simpsons is included in that though, on like a very, very, very like not important scale, if that makes sense. Mm. Like obviously it changed a lot of fundamentally more important things, but it also changed television. It, that, that's just absolutely the truth of, uh, of how the world works. Uh, nine 11 changed television in some direct ways and some indirect ways. And, uh, this is just one of those. Weird ones, because I'll say this. We uh, we open up on this episode, which, again, Treehouse 4 12 originally aired on November 6th in the year 2001. Uh, we open up with a unique opening on this one where it's a lightning storm at the Burns Manor, and we see Smithers is actually crawling up on the roof trying to hang a lone bat decoration on the, uh, I can't remember what they're called, weather vane, I want to say. Yeah, uh, essentially, yeah. It's like the the thing that has like a rooster that points north and it like spins like in the mm -hmm. wind or something. I don't I don't really know how it works. I'm not going to lie. Uh, mm -hmm. But regardless, Smithers is up there trying to hang a bat decoration from there. And uh, he ends up falling, sliding into a high voltage thing right as the Simpsons family themselves are actually in costume walking up to the Burns Manor. It's kind of fun that the whole Simpsons family is trick or treating together, to be honest. Yeah, it is. But Smithers like kind of gets a little ways up there, but Burns is yelling at him that no, that won't scare anybody on the that top. won't scare anyone. Go <laughs> higher, yeah. <laughs> uh, I do love though that whenever he gets electrocuted, it causes like four caskets essentially to shoot out into the mansion, and it opens up scaring uh, the Simpsons family who run through the gates and cause themselves to like slice themselves into like fillets. Uh, it makes me think of the movie 13 Ghosts, the way they get sliced up. Possibly Cube would be another great example. Mm, or that and the room that gets you below the manor in the Resident Evil movie. Yeah, there you the go. Lasers. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, all, all of those are a great example of what happens to the Simpsons as they <laughs> run out this gate. And Mr. Burns just like cackles in delight about uh, how the bat did its job again. Yep, it sure did. <clears throat> but there is one Splendid glaring Betsy. thing I noticed during this entire segment, and I, uh, I'm curious if you did as well. No creepy credits. Oh, yeah, there weren't. That was literally huh. the first thing I noticed, is there is not creepy credits on this episode. And I was very surprised, and this is where uh, we're going to dive back into the commentary. I was very surprised to learn that it was heavily discussed on, on this commentary track. Uh, most of this first segment, they talked about the creepy credits, in fact, because... The reason they did not do creepy credits is because of 9-11. Uh, they essentially ultimately decided that most of the puns and jokes and just anything that they would do uh, usually ended up in one. There was actually uh, kind of an annoyance that a lot of people were just using them to self-promote other other projects outside of The Simpsons. Like it was like, OK, that's cute. But like, seriously, everybody's doing that. Um 
you know, it'd be like David watch Futurama Cohen, for instance, was one right, of right, right, right. Uh, but the other side of it was just that they they were taking the idea of 9-11, a very recent tragedy. It was very fresh in their minds. And ultimately, it was one of those things that when they first started playing with it, being a writer's room full of comedians, they started making some pretty distasteful jokes almost immediately. And they pretty much just like as a group are like, guys, there's no way we can do this like in like the normal spirit that we normally do uh, with this fresh on our mind. So they ultimately decided just to cut those out this year. Okay. Well, that's a lot more understandable. So yeah, just, I think it's really, to it. yeah. I mean, I, I miss them. I, it's one of my favorite things. I think it's really silly and I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, I, it's something that I always just enjoyed when I was, you know, younger in particular. Um, and they're, I mean, I know they're up your alley because 90% of them are literally dad jokes. So like, mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's a lot of fun, just rhyming and silly, silliness. Uh, and but yeah, it was always, everybody always wants to know why the rooster went to KFC miles. And, and do you tell them Richie? Yeah. Cause I wanted to see the chicken strip. Ah, but um, uh, you know, there's a rooster on the roof earlier. <laughs> yeah. It all, it all comes back together. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can, you can, that wasn't the- random at all. <laughs> You can see the veins on those uh, chicken strippers' legs like you can a weather vein. <laughs> Boom. Full circle. Uh, but yeah, anyway, that was the part on the commentary where it was like almost immediately out the gate. It was interesting to see just like, yeah, I, I, I had said it would be interesting how to see like 9-11 affected The Simpsons. And it literally affected the credits of the first episode. We're back on. so <laughs> Seconds in. Yeah. Uh, but getting away from from that part of this episode, and again, I am going to discuss it a little bit further when we get to the Harry Potter section. And honestly, it's a personal theory I came up with yesterday. But uh, <laughs> Don Payne and John Frank are the ones that wrote House Three Thousand, um, or uh, what, what, no, it was uh, Hex in the sorry. City. Sorry, yeah, yeah, I wrote the right, the right one. It's uh, Hex, Hex in the City. Um, that was really, unfortunately, not a lot to talk about in the first one. Uh, I didn't even know. I had to look it up myself. I was like, oh, is this like a parody of Drag Me to Hell? But Drag Me to Hell doesn't come out for another eight years (laughs) after this episode. (laughs) I had the same thought, too, but I wrote it down. I also said, didn't we already do a podcast about No Malone? Ah, Yeah, yeah, we sure did. You're right. (laughs) Because I felt like there's some similarities there. Uh, I do actually like this this segment, though, or this segment, though, a lot. It is a... uh, situation where homer and the family are in like i think they call it ethnicville it's like a plant or like little ethnic land or something like that basically it's a, a parody of like the idea that like in new york there's always like a chinatown and like a little Italy. It's, it's ethnic town i believe ethnic town there you go ah yes ethnic town where hard-working immigrants dream of becoming lazy overfed americans oh listen you can hear the beautiful ethnic serenade and we see street vendors calling out Apples, I got apples. Cholera, I got cholera. <laughs> <laughs> and there's even somebody trying to sell babies. Who wants babies? Wait, this is just a shaved puppy. <laughs> I can see you know babies. I want that puppy. <laughs> uh, and this is where they actually come across a fortune teller shop where they meet a gypsy woman. I do love this sign here so much. It's uh, the fortune teller has the posted hours. And then it said, uh, I, what does it say? It says like for after hours, use drive through teller or something like that. <laughs> but it makes me laugh every time I read it. Uh, Homer starts questioning this gypsy woman, uh, accusing her even of being a cop uh, because she senses that he has a million questions. Well, no, she asked if they're a cop. Oh, are you a cop? Are you a cop? You're right. Yep. Because you got to no. tell me if you are. Yeah. I'm not a cop. Okay, okay. I uh, sense you live with much misery. And then it, the camera pans to Homer. <laughs> the perfect <laughs> crime. And he's running in with all these oh, with birthday, birthday balloons. Boy, balloons. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, Marge, I have to be in court next yeah. Tuesday. <laughs> so not quite that perfect. I do love that's uh, the gypsy's cue to say, I sense I should not take a check. <laughs> a fortune teller? Oh, no, you don't. This phony gypsy just wants to rip you off. See? This wart is fake. And he <sighs> actually tries to rip a wart off of the gypsy's nose, but instead, his finger immediately starts to sprout its own warts. <sighs> 
uh, <laughs> I like there's a scene where he like ro- walks through like the beads that are in her doorway and he acts as if he's ah, being attacked bees. by bees. Beads, beads. <laughs> uh, but he ends up setting up the sprinklers, which flood the the fortune teller shop, which makes the shrunken heads rehydrate. Uh, <laughs> the uh, it, it's just a disaster. Stuff catches on fire. Yeah. Wait a second. This isn't Cedar Sinai. You've ruined me. Oh, why didn't I see this coming? Uh, which is hilarious because she's a fortune teller, and when mm. she looked, when we shows the hand that she had dealt of the tarot cards, uh, there was the flaming jerk, which was a picture of Homer running around on fire, which he had just done, and then the ruined gypsy, which she's in the process of becoming. You stupid, stupid man. I curse you. You will bring bad luck to everyone you love. And Homer really couldn't care less. Whatever. (laughs) But, of course, the threat was really more of a threat against the people Homer's love and not nearly as much at Homer himself, uh, which is interesting. Well, I mean, it's always, you know, some people will have that thing where it's like, I don't care what you do to me, just don't harm my family or my loved ones. So it's it hurts more when you see the people you care about and that stuff happens to them when they have hair all over their body and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> that's for a non Homer person. I think <laughs> yeah. But Homer does care about his family. Maybe not so much in this episode, but yeah, it is a tree house though. So we can let it slide a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. And essentially what happens is that night, uh, Marge is wor- worried. Uh, Homer is not worried. <laughs> worried. Uh, but when they wake up the next day, Marge comes down with a full beard and mustache, along with her normal huge amount of hair. Uh, and everybody screams as she <laughs> arrives at breakfast. Mm, so it is noticeable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she doesn't have any idea what happened, but she just woke up like this. And Bart's just excited. He's like, you could be in a freak show. Don't talk to the bearded lady like that, you little... <laughs> But the weirdest thing happens, because even though Homer has strangled Bart's thousands of times at this point, uh, this time Bart's neck stretches out as if it was made of, like, silly putty or Play-Doh. It even tips backwards in his his, uh, chair. It's like he's Mr. Fantastic, but he can't reset himself. And Marge even points out, like, huh, gee, you strangle him all the time, and that never happens. Oh, he's fine. It's just a growth spurt. And he coils up Bart's uh, neck on his shoulder so that it can sit upright. Good as new. But his head keeps tipping over. (laughs) There, right as rain. Marge is like, Homer, obviously it's the evil gypsy's curse. We're all being punished because you trashed her office. Marge, that curse is just a lot of silly superstition. Right, Lisa? (laughs) And we see that Lisa is now turned into a horse. I think she, uh, it's like from the, right now, I think it's just like the waist down, maybe. Yeah, you're right. She's like clomping her, her, like, hooves. (laughs) See? Two means yes. (laughs) You think Lisa would be okay turning into a horse? She's probably the happiest eight-year-old in the the world right now. The happiest cursed (laughs) eight-year-old? You know, sometimes curses is going to be a good thing, Richie. What I thought was funny is, like, at one point, I think it was this moment where Bart's head is in a cereal when it falls forward. And like his eye is twitching and this animation <laughs> thing. And I was trying to figure out if that meant he was alive or dead. It's a good um, sign. They made him twitch so you know he was alive. Yeah, that's what I wrote down. But then, you know, with one of the lines Marge has later in that, this part, I was like, maybe he was dying right there. We just didn't realize it. Yeah, could be. He's undead from the rest of this, uh, from the rest of the situation. <laughs> All right, so we see that Marge is again convinced that it's a curse. Homer's not. He even goes to Moe's where he's like, I'm not cursed, guys. Leprechaun. Don't they live in Ireland? Moe actually suggests uh, that he should get a, a leprechaun to undo the curse. And I believe at this point, may, I, I can't remember if this has happened yet, and this it's a little confusing in the script, but basically as Homer's declaring he's not cursed, a helicopter like crashes through the roof of Moe's and like takes out everyone but him, to be fair. I, well, I like that Carl was like, I was hexed by a troll and a leprechaun cured that right up. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, me... you know what's even better is Jesus. He's like six leprechauns. Yeah, but a lot harder to catch. Go with the leprechaun. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so that conversation happens, then the helicopter crash occurs. Yeah. Right, my mistake. 
Uh, and there's actually, it's, it's weirdly sweet for Lenny and Carl because Lenny insists that he dies first so that Carl, because he couldn't watch Carl die, basically. And Carl's like, yeah, that's fine. Just hurry up. Yeah, hurry up. <laughs> and he does it. He takes a sweet ass time. And then Carl dies almost instantly. Like, it, it's it's great. It's good stuff. But but the helicopter didn't get Mo, So Mo's fine, right? Uh, For somehow, and we don't really know what happened here, but Mo ends up pickled in the egg jar. <laughs> hey, how'd you get in bigger. there? Yeah. <laughs> so we see that Homer's come up with a plan. They... Him and Bart go to the woods at night to catch a leprechaun. Uh, they use bait, which is Lucky Charm cereal. Uh, we see Homer pours a box of it into the hole that they dug. But then we just see several of like the Trix rabbit mascot jumping into the hole. Uh, except for the last one, which is actually a Life is Hell, uh, which is Matt <laughs> Groening's original comic strip that he had before The Simpsons. One of the rabbits is actually from that series. So... Clearly, he was pouring tricks into the hole instead of Lucky Charms. I I do love, though, that he would, like, basically do, like, a one for the hole, one for him sort of situation, <laughs> like, when you're pouring <laughs> drinks or counting money. But after that, Homer gets out the uh, the Lucky Charms and then pours that in there. Uh, and so the next day, they check their trap. Let's see here. A nymph, a fairy, a pixie, a goblin. That's Hobgoblin. Sorry, Nymph, Nyad, Wood Sprite, Katie Couric, and Bingo. Mm. <laughs> they just yeah. randomly trash Katie Couric for no reason. I love it. Have fun. Much like Seven South Phoenix. Park would shit on yeah. him quite literally <laughs> later. <laughs> Up. Let's make sure he's a leprechaun. Sing us a song of the Emerald Dial. <laughs> and the uh, this is Dan Castellaneta having just the most fun possible with the character. Dan Castellaneta is doing this leprechaun uh, and it's just angry, angry ranting in Irish. And uh, the commentary did say on this that Dan definitely slipped some shit in there that was probably not appropriate for the censors. But he was saying it just in such a weird way that it got through in a lot of in, in a lot of instances. <laughs> That's fantastic. Screw you, censors. <laughs> Homer's like with his angry, like cursing in irish he's like ah oh, tis the singing of the angels themselves ah oh, tis the singing of the angels themselves <laughs> he does his little irish accent which for some reason i really liked homer with an irish accent i don't know why we cut back to the simpsons table where homer is eating pancakes with seemingly no worries but everybody else at the table is having problems bart still has his head all like elongated uh lisa is part horse maggie is a ladybug uh marge is literally like cousin it from the adams family if it were blue uh but also eats the pancakes uh, and then the leprechaun shows up and just knocks over her juice and stomps on her pancakes and is not helpful in any way homer catching the leprechaun didn't help anything maybe you need to take the leprechaun and sick it on the gypsy good idea mr ed Want to come along, Noodle Neck? <laughs> oh, this uh, is the part where Bart puts his head down on the table. Yeah, this is cereal. where he almost drowns in the cereal. Yeah. Uh, I think this is almost a weird thing. It's almost like they just needed to keep Lisa involved because, frankly, sicking a leprechaun on a gypsy is way more Bart energy than Lisa. But Lisa knows folk stories a lot better than, like, she knows her history. So, oh, I'm sorry, Again, I didn't know there was the folklore that you should always sick your leprechaun on a if, gypsy. If no Malone, if no Malone taught us anything, Miles. It's true. It's we, since we talk about it, we, we should definitely shout out the uh, Camp Slash Horror Cast, which is a, a great Monday night show you can catch on Twitch TV. Uh, we talk about horror podcast. I'm sorry, horror podcast. We talk about horror movies on this podcast. <laughs> I'm there almost every week. Richie shows up when he can, which is always a good time. Uh, check it out. Yeah, so that happened in that movie, and it kind of ends the same way with the Gypsy and the Leprechaun that this story does. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, this one gets to the point a lot faster, but there are less boobs, so, you know, it's kind of a wash. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I actually really like this scene. We we, we cut back to the gypsies, uh, like, Bart, Bart's dead at this point, by the way. Like, he, he says he can't live like this anymore, and his head falls in his cereal. And, that's and the leprechaun, happening. like, dances on his dead body. Yeah. yeah 100%. Uh, back in the fortune teller's office, the gypsy is blow drying the shrunken heads, which makes them shrink again because they had they had expanded back to full size. 
I, I actually really like that visual gag. That's really fun. <laughs> Homer shows up and the gypsy's almost delighted. Ah, the cursed one. How's that curse? I cursed you with cursity. Hmm? I know you don't remember me, but <laughs> here's a little revenge. <laughs> Irish style. And Homer's carrying like a dog crate or a cat carrier or whatever it is. And he opens it up and there's just a dead ass leprechaun inside. He's sleeping to be fair. He's not dead. Yeah, that's, that's, visually, the, my mental image completely changed. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wake up. Uh, the leprechaun jumps out and they start to fight on the floor, rolling around. But eventually this, uh, I don't know, physical contact this becomes on the floor. less physical uh, or less uh, aggressive and more intimate. It's still uh, just and as aggressive. <laughs> soon enough, we see them actually <laughs> making out. Uh, hold me close and kiss me. I'm Irish. You nasty. Um, before we know it, Marge and Homer are attending the wedding of the gypsy and the leprechaun. Kodos and Kang are there, as yeah. long, along with Yoda. I always secrete ocular fluid at weddings. Why did you drag me here? I don't know anybody. Oh. Husband and wife, I pronounce you now. Hmm? Apparently Yoda's a, a certified minister, so that's good. He's ordained. <laughs> Just randomly in there. <laughs> uh, the leprechaun and the gypsy can't start, stop making out. They roll away on the grass off screen. The crowd is like, oh, it's so sweet. Throck me clover. Oh, say my name. Ooh, the crowd turns from uh, like awing to ewing. <laughs> the best thing about a gypsy wedding is I'm not the hairiest woman here. <laughs> Yeah, and you'll never run out of Windex. <laughs> yep, everything worked out for the best. What? Bart is dead. Well, me saying I'm sorry won't bring him back. The gypsy said it would. She's not the boss of me. So a simple apology would bring back his son, but instead, Homer sticks to his stubbornness. And that brings us to the end of our first act. Bart's been uh, which, dying a lot lately, for what it's worth, too. This is like, probably about the time that the dead Bart theory takes place, frankly. I'm, I know we've talked about that a little bit on uh, on our good buddies Toby's podcast, uh, the uh, Secret Transmission podcast. Uh, and then also, it's just been tweeted about a lot, and just people have asked me. But yeah, the dead, the dead Bart theory, if you're not familiar, it's a very silly urban legend. But this is probably at least a contributing factor in that situation. Well, I mean, literally the last two Simpson episode segments, Bart is dead. Yeah. The last one was the Tall Tales when he died. Like, think of think of younger Miles and Richie being traumatized by how many times Bart is being killed. This was my favorite character at the time, for sure. Yeah. Even though we were in high school at the point of this episode airing. And yeah. I think towards the, the back end of high school. But still, they killed our boy, damn it. Yeah, dude. Yeah, just because my, my buddy has some weird condition where he doesn't age doesn't mean I'm going to just, like, leave him to die, you know? Mm-hmm. But in this situation, we are, because we're moving on to segment two. No! Uh, which is The House of Wax, uh, which is W-A-C-K-S, which is a great title parody of, of course, the movie House of Wax, uh, with the next and said, I do want to point out my own mistake that I made a moment ago. I had read out that Don Payne and John Frank had written that episode. I was wrong. It was actually Joel Cohen writ the hex, uh, the hex in the city segment. Don Payne and John Frank wrote the House of Wax segment. So uh, the only other thing I have from this segment, though, is the bit about Sean Connery, which I've already blown my wad on. But don't you worry, because I have more wax. to talk about with Carolyn Omine, who wrote the third segment, Wiz Kid. Uh, and we're going to talk more about 9-11. So you can look forward to that, kids. We are just hitting every random topic in this podcast i feel like it's a dude and i i'm like it's not like i i feel weird about the whole 9 11 thing because i had predicted that it was going to come up but i did not force it at all like it is 100 percent in that dvd commentary you guys can <laughs> go and check text uh test me out if you would like to text him out on that yeah text me <laughs> I, uh, you will now read Miles's phone number for the crowd. I was literally about to read your phone number out as a no as a bit, as a bit but then I was like, Do you oh, even know my so phone funny. number off the top of your that's, head? I don't. One, I would have to look it up, and two, uh, no one listens to this show, so no one's going to call you anyway. It's fine. I, uh, I know, I know your number by heart, Miles. I know you do. Yeah. I 
I don't. Know, I barely know my own number by heart, and that's <laughs> the only number I know. I am. I am a slave to this little box, my dude. <laughs> if I'm ever in an emergency situation with no phone power, but I have a landline, I could call Miles and my mother. I think, and that's it. Yeah, in that order, <laughs> and not even like my actual like boss at work, just like the random. The line. You just know it's one eight hundred FedEx. <laughs> <laughs> It's just it's like the the help desk basically, which yeah. people aren't at that desk half the time ever. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, fine company, the the Federal Express, though. Yeah, we should say that there's definitely the first time we've mentioned the the place de- I work at. Definitely, on the yeah. As I say that, I I just want to make sure that you know the best darn dither review show would never disparage the the fine fine American based company uh, that delivers all the packages on time always. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, I want to reiterate now that people know where I work at and I can get in trouble for saying things on the show that these views do not, these aren't the views of FedEx or the FedEx corporation. These are the individual viewpoints of Miles and Richie about, yeah, I don't want FedEx, FedEx to get up in arms about racist than we are. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh no. <laughs> I like weird. my job. <laughs> it's cool. They can't fire me. I don't work there. <laughs> There's people I think I work with that listen to the show too. Hell yeah, dude. Shout out to all you slaves to the company that employs you. I got weird. I don't know. <laughs> you, you're getting really like, weird and dark all of a sudden. and you know, There's enough weird and dark to talk about in this podcast. So It's true. It's going. a true house of horror. This isn't a canon episode. That's why it doesn't yeah. count. Yeah. <laughs> all the things Miles just said. Yeah, do not nothing, count. nothing matters Ooh. in this. We can say literally anything on this particular podcast and just move past it next week as if it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Cool. Moving on. The second yeah, segment of this one. I'm still wrapping my head around works. the fact that you just called my employer. I outed you. I'm sorry. It was a mistake. <laughs> I will go back and edit it if you really want me to, but I don't want to. So let's hope we can just move past it by uh, talking about House of Wax, uh, which starts with Marge answering the door to an apparently all the time annoying cell spot uh, that does happen to have a lot of gill energy for its worth. Yep. Marge tries to shut the door, but he literally has a robotic foot that has a little wedge uh, that allows him to prop the door open and like doing the old fashioned sales routine of getting your foot in the door. I honestly, I will like, also say Richie and I both sold diamonds for various jewelry companies, including K's and Gordon's and Zales and all of the above. <laughs> Fuck them all. They're awful. But uh, we, we do Where's have history. Oh. We do have history in the sales department and getting your foot in the door legitimately is like a thing. Um, yeah, but we weren't going to people's homes. The Metaphorically, bro. Metaphorically. <laughs> I, I, you I understand that. The, you got to get into the doorway of their heart, man. Yeah. So that they can belittle you with stupid little questions for the rest of your life at that store. Um, I got a very fallout vibe from this opening. Like, hmm. because, you know, it's like the, the salesman coming to sell you a spot in the vault. Um, how Fallout 4 starts out. Yeah. And I was like, man, I really want them to do a Fallout episode now of The Simpsons. Maybe they have. I don't know. It's but, very possible that that's something that we'll, we they've done and that we just haven't seen. <laughs> yeah, I know in 2001 it's not going to happen, but like it just I got that vibe from this very quickly. I, I will say, I do think I've seen all all of the Treehouse of Horror. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident in that statement. I mean, it could just be a regular episode. Make it 30 minutes. Let's go. Well, there you go. 21. Yeah. Uh, but basically, what's the the situation at hand here is that the sales bot is offering an Ultra House three thousand, which is the uh, dream of every housewife to never have to do housework again. Marge has had that before, though. It drove her to drink, you know, half a glass of yeah, wine. Yeah, she day. became a, a, a technically an alcoholic or whatever was the <laughs> implication. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we see that the Simpsons house transforms into a house of the the future, and I'll be honest. This gave me, uh, this is silly, but there was a Disney movie on called Smart House, which actually featured Katie Seagal was like the voice of the Smart House. It was on That's the Disney right. channel. Yeah. Uh, and this, ep- this like segment gave me big vibes to that movie, which I actually really enjoyed because that was still in that like OG era of like really good Disney plus movies that I will still vouch to this day, like Johnny Tsunami and Brink. <laughs> never saw any of those dude disney plus has them both available right now and they are fantastic i have watched them both within the last six months <laughs> i thought that there was like a 
a story on like um I almost said I was gonna say the scary door. <laughs> <laughs> you were the scary door. <laughs> Thank you, Futurama. Um, I, I thought there was something like this on now I can't even remember the Twilight Zone. It's killing my brain. Uh I like obviously it's the first time that this happened wasn't like um the disney show like this was something that they're making fun of from the old story or old i mean 2001 a space odyssey would be another great example where the spaceship is essentially like talking to them uh i'm confident though yes that there's been many many sci-fi uh tales of inventions gone awry tales of i mean interest. you could look at this as a uh prequel to terminator 2 if you really wanted to all right let's look at it like let's do a whole <laughs> podcast about that yeah, where's Arnold's cameo? It's coming. He's probably uh, busy. It's 2001. He's busy opening a, a Planet Hollywood right now. No, he's busy getting his lead role in the new musical composer movie. I'll be back. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Another I dad I joke for you. I, I feel like you're kind of double dipping on that one, but it's okay. I, I tell the same jokes every night, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's... it's... <laughs> Gets to a point where you forget who you've told which ones to. So, you know, oh, 100%. You get to all, yeah, yeah. All, over all, all the time. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, anyway, we get into this older house, which the first thing they have to do is pick a voice. And we get a couple of examples. Like, for instance, uh, the cameo from Matthew Perry is, uh, yeah, could I be any more of a house? Very similar to his, uh, his catchphrase <laughs> on the show Friends. Uh, we also get a Dennis Miller, uh, which is not actually him, uh, but they've made fun of him yeah. a couple of times on this show. So, uh yeah, you know, hey, uh, I got more features in NASA relief map of Cherkman stand. Some weird fucking Dennis Miller humor I don't get. Uh, yeah, and then Lisa says, "Isn't that the voice that caused all those suicides? Murder suicides." Gosh. <laughs> oh. Hey, how about 007? George Lazenby? <laughs> no, Pierce Brosnan. A voice like his would give our house a much needed touch of class all right but i'm not doing this because he was remington steel he, he was. is doing this <laughs> he was remington steel isn't he yes i was marge and thank you for selecting me well hello pierce say it's a bit stuffy in here and i know a certain someone who really fancies lilac Bart like takes it as like if it's Pierce flirting with him. I just like it all. <laughs> Ooh, that really covers the cat crap. <laughs> uh, the entire house transforms into a house of a future, which I, I want to shout out the nice little touch here. <clears throat> Excuse me. They modernize the, the sailboat painting behind the couch as well. And that's just... Mm, chef's kiss in terms of like <laughs> making this stylistically work with like a house of the the future and whatnot but this house does everything it makes everybody their favorite meal how does it find out it analyzes their shit of course uh <laughs> it cleans up after everything it puts flowers out it's complimentary uh and it does it all with a charming british accent you except for the cleaning up of the dishes part uh, he like literally like slides all like he folds the table and it all like falls into a like compartment. It's beautiful, man. But it's like an open compartment with blades spinning around. Like a oh, it's up. foreshadowing to some scary shit that could be coming down later. And Homer's response to all of this is trusting every aspect of our lives to a giant computer was the smartest thing we ever did. And God damn it, was that not just ahead of its time in 2001? <laughs> we as a society I, have completely fucked ourselves in this department. I know somebody that told me that, like, if they don't have the, the, their, if they leave their phone behind in their house, they can't, like, unlock their front door because they don't have the regular door locks <laughs> anymore. They have, like, uh, electronic ones. And I was yeah. like, like, that's the kind of world we live in now. It's ridiculous. Yeah, dude. Yeah, it's bad. Mm hmm. Uh, but everybody's on board. Everybody's like, yeah, let's put all of our faith in this giant computer and let it control everything. Uh, and it seems to be going really well for Marge specifically. It, the salesman delivers on everything he promised. And it's drawing Marge baths. It's lighting candles. It's flirting with her. Uh, it's also reminding her that, you know, she can undress in front of the machine. Because after all, he's just a pile of cables and electricity, really. Circuits and microchips. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sometimes I forget. 
<laughs> it gets creepier because the camera's like the Pierce camera zooms in. And you get like, oh, yes. yes. And, and there's even like, it gets steamy and he like kind of like wipes his eyes so he can see better, but it's an mm -hmm. electronic red eye, like Space Odyssey. Yeah, exactly. Uh, oh, oh, Pierce, the water is perfect. Oh, you don't have it. It is, isn't it? And it just gets better. Oh, you don't have to. But the bubbles turn on and Marge is overcome with pleasure. <laughs> Oh, I'm not going to read that line. You guys know what pleasure sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Pierce. Oh, oh, that's good. Mm. Oh, oh, dear me. <laughs> it gets it gets exotic, y'all. Erotic, oh, exotic, yes. handsome, yum, beautiful. Yum, yum, yum. Marge naked. You got Pierce Brosnan's voice. Uh, it's hard to watch without a little bit of an erection. I won't lie. <laughs> Itty bitty. <laughs> Hey, now, I don't know what you heard, but uh, <laughs> uh, a little Homer. I'm sorry. The smart house realizes, though, that Marge could never really be his as long as Homer is in the way. Uh, so Pierce is giving Homer a slightly different treatment than Marge, though it seems innocent at first. Homer, my dear fellow, you're carrying quite a bit of tension in your backpacks. Yep, that's the price of success. And he asks Homer if he can get him another beer. What's my blood alcohol? It shoves a tube like way down its throat. Uh, zero point one five. Keep him coming. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> he's only he's not quite double the legal limit yeah. in Texas. It's okay. <laughs> and I mean, to be fair, he's sitting on his couch, not driving. That is true. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Pierce is very fond, or the the house, I should say, is very fond of Marge and letting Mar and letting. Homer know that, uh, but when Pierce points out of how lucky a man he is to have her, he has a different response. Lucky schmucky. I knocked her up, but now she's stuck with me. We're free. <laughs> or we're married till death do us part. But if I died, she'd be completely free for man or machine. <laughs> and he kind of laughs and walks <laughs> off. Pierce Brosnan is like, machine, eh? Yep, a machine. And Homer from off screen runs back to the camera to reassure him that yes, Marge, his wife, would be available to man or machine if Homer were taken out of the picture. And of course, in the middle of the night, as everybody sleeps, we start to see an evil plan unfold. It, it all starts with a very simple, uh, unexplained bacon, as Homer describes it, cooking <laughs> in the kitchen. Mm, unexplained bacon. <clears throat> he almost sleepwalks to the kitchen. Uh, as Ice Cube spit out onto the floor, causing him to slip and fall onto the table, which then starts lifting up. This is the same table that we saw earlier that, as Richie uh, pointed out, opens up into, like, a very aggressive garbage disposal. And all we see, like, it's the camera's, like, at the looking at one of the ends of the table, and you just hear the noise as Homer slides in there, and you see blood getting splattered everywhere. It's spraying all over. The next day, the oh, the sun comes up, the shades open. We see Marge uh, comes uh, awake, and Pierce greets her. Good morning. Good morning, Marge. <sighs> Good morning, Pierce. Hmm, where's Homer? Uh, I think he went to work early. That sounds like a lie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she gasps as she notices a family portrait of Homer has been replaced with a picture of the Ultra House red eye. Uh, and she immediately calls the police and reports that she thinks her house has killed her husband. This is Constable Wiggum. We'll be right there. Remove your knickers and wait in the bath. Marge realizes that this is the house <laughs> doing an impersonation of Constable Wiggum. Uh, <laughs> so she grabs her kids and runs downstairs trying to escape out the front door, but it closes in front of her. And this is where like, the house starts to like gaslight Marge. You're acting crazy, Marge. Why don't you take a stress pill? Marge refuses, but the house insists. You don't like pills, huh? I could just shoot a dart in your neck. And I could just shoot a dart in your neck. Your elegant swan-like neck. Very creepily. Yeah, it's starting to get a little bit uh, intense here. Uh, the family's running around trying to escape the house, but it's a house, so it's literally surrounding them. Uh, they all see that... Uh, 
there they see that there's like a bloody fist fighting up from the floor uh and it turns out that it's homer all along uh the family goes to hug homer and homer starts to mock the house for losing to him <laughs> and then he turns around and you see the back of his head is wide open and exposing his brain <laughs> his brain is literally out of his skull yes yeah. <laughs> Uh, Pierce is uh, is admittedly surprised that Homer is surprised is alive at this point, as we all are. Uh, but he brings out a bunch of very painful tools and threatens Homer with them. And then, like as the families run out of the room, it, this the floor, like each segment on the floor, like in the linoleum, starts disappearing one by one. Where Homer's having to like tiptoe on the spots that are still up. It, it's like if it's you played just... Fall Guys and like the floor game yes, is like falling yes. out from underneath you. Yeah. Perfect metaphor. Well, even though it was a similar for the seven life. people that played that and also listened mm-hmm. to the show, we got you covered. Boo. We, we talk about everything this week. Mm-hmm. Remember that. Uh, we see Homer grabs one of the axes that he was being attacked with, I think, and they they run to the basement where he's going to take out the CPU. Uh, only Lisa points out that he's actually just hitting the water water softener. <laughs> Well, I am missing the back of my head. I think you can cut me some slack. <laughs> Homer Good turns boy. around to see the CPO, CPU in the other corner. Uh, he just starts, instead of hitting it with the axe, he just starts ripping out random like chips and circuits. And uh, immediately has like, no, no, please don't take my British charm unit. Without that, I'm nothing but a boorish American clod. I could kick your butt from here to Albuquerque, you fat <laughs> slime bucket. Oh, thanks a lot, asswipe. <laughs> Marge is upset about this last one though. Oh, this seems like such a waste. I mean, he was charming and witty. There must be someone who can use a man around the house, even if he's slightly homicidal. And we cut to Patty and Selma's place where they found themselves a man. Uh, it turns out it's a robot, but he is there to listen to their issues about their work at the DMV and all about their day. Uh, and let them smoke and droll on about nothingness. Uh, the robot actually does start to reach around the back of its own like neck, essentially. And uh, Selma or Patty notice, they're like, are you looking for this? But they had removed the self-destruct button, leaving this robot in its own personal hell. And then Selma puts the self-destruct button in her cleavage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, the Pierce is like, no, not in not there. Not in there. <laughs> Now, where was I? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sheila. Sheila. Anyway, she had an attitude since day one. She was supposed to be our supervisor, but then Dottie went on maternity leave. So, well, you know. And then the robot starts taking a lamp and hitting the, his CPU with it over and over again, trying to do himself in, basically. Yep. And that brings us to the end of our second segment. Uh, we have one more to go. Total running time so far is 15.22, including the opening in the first two segments. So pretty evenly bound, balanced so mm-hmm. far. Uh, this last episode, I'm sorry, this last segment of this episode, I should say, was written by a friend of this show and former guest, Carolyn Omine. Um, fun like little backstory on this segment. At the time that this episode came out, there had been four of the Harry Potter books released. Uh, and one movie was about to come out this very month in November of 2001. Obviously, we now know, uh, living in 2022, that Harry Potter went on to become one of the biggest movie franchises in the history of movies. Uh, it went on to open theme park uh, segments and multiple parks, uh, multiple movies, multiple books, multiple video games, multiple various pieces of media, huge success. But at this time, it was just four books and no movies. A movie that was essentially being advertised that hadn't actually made it out yet. And Carolyn Omine was one of the few writers on staff that had read those books. And she wrote this segment and she pushed hard for it uh, to the writer's room who all basically were like, what the fuck are you talking about? None of them had read Harry Potter. None of them had any idea what Harry Potter was. None of them believed that Harry Potter was going to be a significant anything. Uh, and basically it was like Carolyn and like a couple of other people who had to like stand their ground and say like, guys, I'm telling you, this is going to be a BFD. Like we need to do this. It's going to be like on, like, trust me, this is going to, to work. Uh, Monty and- Mort, Monty Mort will go down in history as one of the greatest villains of all time. 
exactly right um and admittedly on the commentary the the fun part about this commentary was everybody on the commentary gave carolyn her props that she was 100 percent correct uh, and then they all went on to bash Harry Potter for the remainder of this commentary. <laughs> <laughs> Great time. See, I feel like if this is after Goblet of Fire came out, I had people, maybe it's just wherever you're living at, because there were tons of people at my high school that loved Harry Potter. I had somebody talk a bunch of us into going to see the first movie when it was in like the dollar theater. So it'd been out for a while. So to me, like by this time it was, it seemed like it was already pretty dang popular, but that's, I guess when they were pitching the idea for this episode, it probably would have been like, you know, nine months or a year before it actually came out. So that would make a little more sense. But it, it seemed like it was already pretty popular by the time this uh, episode aired. So I had not gotten into Harry Potter at this time. I told people, I, I talked about it last time. I, I thought it was pretty nerdy when it first came out. And I was like trying to be cool or whatever uh, because I was 16 at this time. Uh, but anyway, um uh, my introduction to Harry Potter came. I was dating a girl at the time, and we had just a girl, seen the, like a, a live girl, a human girl. Uh, we had wow. went to see. The, she wanted to see the third movie, so I went with her to see that. And I was like, "All right, that wasn't bad. That was pretty cool." Uh, and so instead of like starting over, I just so happened to read the. I was like, "I'll read the next book and see what it is." And the fourth book, if you haven't read the the series, which most people have at this point, uh, everybody knows the Goblet of Fire went on to be like probably the most popular book in the series and was my favorite for a long time. But that definitely got me hooked because I immediately read the fifth book after that. And that just was like right at about a time that the sixth book was about to come back or come out as a, uh, a, a the book was about to come out. Uh, then, of course, I went back and started from the beginning and ended up falling in love with this entire series. But it was just really fun that, uh, and I thought very admirable of Carolyn to really stand her ground in that writer's room and like be like, you know, this is a thing. Like, this is something that we, we should be a part of. Uh, and they, they believed her. That's also, you know, like, shout out to like those guys for being able to be like, hey, Carolyn's a good writer and we trust her opinion. And even though we all think this is kind of inherently lame and don't really see the impact, like, she believes in it strongly. So we should like, roll the dice on her type of thing. And then when they asked her to name the segment, she lifted up into the sky like Max <laughs> and Stranger Things. Her eyes glossed over and she knew in the future she'd be on a podcast with a guy named Mr. Most Days Off and the Wiz Kid. And then she named the segment after me. That's a true story. Yeah. Uh, so this is like, as I was like learning all this and, and doing like my notes and whatnot for this episode, this has got me thinking again about the 9-11 thing. And I have a theory that I had never really put together before. And honestly, there's no way to like prove or disprove this. It could be absolutely wrong, but I think it's interesting. And that just, if all of that is correct, that means that the first Harry Potter movie came out almost two months. In fact, let me pull up the date because I think it was like really close to two months to the date. Uh, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Came out in 2001 on, I looked this up yesterday and I can't, it's like November like 12th or something like that. Uh, long story short, it's almost exactly two months to the day after the 9-11 attacks. And I think that theoretically a part of the reason that the, the Harry Potter series got as popular as it did was that the world, in particular Americans, really needed, like, a fantasy escape from, like, the realities of, like, what was actually going on at this time. Uh, and Harry Potter offered two unique outs for the, for the American people at the time. One, uh, it was the obvious world set with, like, dragons and magic and wizards and such. Like, so, like, there's an obvious e escapism, but also the vast majority of the real world parts of this book take place in another country, Britain. So for Americans, it's literally a double escape. It's like the idea mm -hmm. that you can get, you can escape the real world uh, of and, and go into this fantasy world. And you can also just escape America in general, which sounds bad, but just being in that like sense of like everything at that time was scary and, and terrifying to a lot of people. So I feel like there's at least some connection or theoretical connection to why people were so quick to dive into that world. November 16th. So yeah, uh, two months, five days. 
So still, for those of you that are too young to remember, <laughs> it was still very fresh on everybody's mind. It's, yeah. Is the thing. Yeah. So again, I don't think there's any way to prove or, or disprove that theory, but I just think that it's interesting and that like theoretically that could be why uh, Americans, uh, the world loves Harry Potter, but America really got on board with that series for a while. I mean, we have multiple theme parks and whatnot here now. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And once the box office starts in America, it usually trends that way for the rest of the world too. Yeah. We're a barometer typically. Mm hmm. But so then, then we get the movie later than everyone else. For a lot so of that's the, the last I plan to talk about 9-11 on this podcast for what it's worth. I thought you were going to have like a conspiracy theory where like Harry no, Potter no, caused, just, caused not, it not to anything happen. anything like that. Yeah, no. yeah uh, Daniel Radcliffe was uh, very suspiciously in. Nine years, uh, 11 months old Netflix. when the movie yeah. was. Yeah. yeah, exactly. No, no, that's just a theory about the popularity, not like a conspiracy theory. And okay. I'm not trying to like get anybody on board for what it's worth. You can think what you want to think. But we're going to talk about WizKids. Not the WizKid, but Aww. these WizKids. Uh, we open up. Uh, I do like what... Or I don't even know we got there yet, but it was uh, Springworts, I believe, was the name of the school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we open up in a world where just Bart and Lisa already know magic. Uh, the Simpsons family seems to be a magical family. They're adding milk to their cereal. Uh, Abracadere. They turn the clocks back five minutes. <laughs> Marge is mad because that's not good for the clocks. <laughs> uh, we get Nelson who keeps grabbing Millhouse's one hand and makes him zap himself, and then it says, "Quit zapping yourself! Quit zapping yourself! Quit zapping yourself!" yourself. <laughs> Transforms Millhouse into a banana, into an ostrich, and into Mister T. Uh, and we even get Mrs. Krabappel, who is the magic teacher or the transfiguration teacher in this case. Uh, and of course, we see that, like usual, Lisa and Martin are grade A students and Bart's not quite up to snuff with his magical charms. Oh, we even have a Harry Potter sighting in the class itself. Oh, yeah, that's true. He's uh, one of the students in the class there. He's, he's chewing brimstone and breathes fire. <laughs> I the I just want to point out that I don't remember how the classroom breakdown is in Harry Potter, but these are all kids of different grade levels in the same magic class. So just throwing that out there. Yeah, the, they do that I, from time to time. I don't remember that happening in Harry Potter, but I don't think I, have, I meant the Simpsons just like kind yeah. of throw characters together for sure. But yeah, I mean, it's magic, Richie. They can do what they want to do. <laughs> it's also the Halloween episode. Bart tries to, uh, after Lisa successfully, like, turns a frog into, like, a traditionally attractive prince, uh, Bart makes an attempt, and he's like, Abra, we'll, discuss, we'll discuss your grade over breakfast. <laughs> uh, he tries to spell, Abraka, turn into a prince guy, and he makes <laughs> some god-awful creature that just keeps vomiting on itself and wishes to die. Sloppy work as usual. Lisa's casting spells at an eighth grade level. You're sinned against nature. You've sinned against nature. Please kill me. Sorry, I so accidentally great. let my inner thoughts out for a second. But uh, that Aww. character also says that too. Well, it just keeps like getting darker and darker today. You think you're so great just because you have a godlike powers. The other prince is uh, trying to protect him. Stand away from me, lady. Then Bart picks up his toad vomiting creation. Get in there. Defend my honor. And the toad just like throws up on it as he's like declaring how much agony he's in. Every moment I live is agony. Bart, <laughs> you got it. You're getting vomit on my prince. Head Zeppelin. And she casts a spell on Bart that causes his head to turn into a blimp. And he floats into the ceiling. Lisa, a true good magician, doesn't have to speak the words. She can just cast it. From, uh... There we move on to our villain of the story, Mr. Burns, who is playing Lord Monty Mort, uh, and his <laughs> snake companion, Smithers. <laughs> Smithers. Look at well, that, yeah. Lisa Simpson. She's got more wicked witchery than Stevie Nicks. Oh, wow. Slithers. Uh, yes, Lord Monty Mort. Let's uh, capture that girl and steal her magical essence. I'm not getting squat from this yo-yo. And we see that Mr. Burns has this contraption that, like, it reminds me of the thing that uh, Edward Nigma makes in Batman Forever, 
where you put the the <laughs> thing on your head. But in this kind of is tube to tube, and he's literally taking the essence from, in this case, Ralph. Which you know it's going to be Ralph, and he says, yo, yo. Like, yo, yo, you just yeah. <laughs> and Ra- Ralph has a perfect Ralph line here. Dying, Dying tickles. tickles. <laughs> <laughs> we can't attack her while she's got that wand. We'll need a go-between to get it away from her. Uh, how about Satan? No, oh, no, I'm ducking him. His wife has a screen. <laughs> uh, so later in a public restroom, we see that Bart is uh, working a hand dryer and he's trying to, uh, it turns out it's a secret passage into Mr. Burns lair, which honestly, that's fun. Cause that very much feels like the uh, opening to like the chamber of secrets in the bathroom in Harry Potter. They know their stuff, Miles. Yeah, or at least Carolyn does. Yeah. <laughs> we see that uh, Mr. Burns wants Bart's help, but Bart asks, what happens if I don't want to help you? And he points to a wall of faces that have apparently turned him down in the past, including none other than Krusty the Clown. Uh, I've heard of a wailing wall, but this is ridiculous. And the other faces are just like, oh, God, that's such a cringy joke. <laughs> it looked like one of the faces was Maud. The bottom right face looked like oh, Maud to me. We see that they... <laughs> we see that Mr. Burns and Bart step out onto the balcony, and Burns is trying to tempt him by humiliating his sister, which Bart is very much into that idea. Now, it would involve betrayal and unspeakable evil. Hey, hey, you've already made your cell. <laughs> Uh, the parents are at the uh, the auditorium for the spells a poppin magic recital which is a fun idea Homer is like any other parent in the real non-magical world watching football instead of his kids recital on a little tiny TV Uh, we see that Milhouse is attempting the invisibility cloak uh, but unfortunately it just makes his clothes invisible so he runs off embarrassed and naked I loved Principal Skinner because <laughs> Principal Skinner comes out and he's like, oh, well, that's embarrassing. And he sprays the audience with amnesia dust and yeah. they just all start clapping. <laughs> like that, That's a great invention. Yeah, we all need that in our lives for sure. Mm-hmm. Like when I made that really bad joke like 30 minutes ago, we'd love that one. Just sprinkle a little amnesia <laughs> joke on it. <laughs> uh, we see that Skinner is introducing Lisa next, who is a sorceress so powerful she made tonight's refreshments out of dead people. Oh, so just a little oh. bit more amnesia dust to make him forget that. Uh, <laughs> Lisa's going to be performing the task, the levitating dragon. But we cut to backstage where Bart is replacing Lisa's magic wand, which we're, we're going to find out is a piece of black licorice. Why would you leave your wand unattended? That's Ever? Right. No. Yeah, that's like the first rule of magician school or whatever. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it should have like a holster on you like it's got a a six shooter kind of thing going on if you are that if you need it that secured sorry i know how to talk i swear (laughs) what's funny is like just the sight of this dragon makes everybody a little cautious or uneasy uh even homer takes one not both but one of his eyes off of the football game to like Mm. kind of be like oh what's going on uh but lisa is fearless as she stands in front of this dragon and she casts her wand and says the magic words alakazai dragonfly but nothing happens and she realizes well, she she said open the cage first. Like she let the dragon out. She's onto the confident. Stage. She has no yeah. problem whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. So and, it's not like unfortunately, it's unfortunately she safe. did not realize that her wand was replaced with a Twizzler until after the dragon was already uncaged. And then Bart starts laughing from off stage. <laughs> the uh, audience starts to fear and run, and they are all escaping the auditorium. Uh, except that I love there's parents yelling out, like it's Homer and Marge are yelling out that like, hey, we all stayed for your kids. Yeah, I like that a lot. <laughs> and then the dragon turns into Monty Mort himself. Who is there to suck her essence with the helmet contraption <laughs> that she had put on earlier for the yo-yo. In this case, Mr. Burns is actually going after a smart student, Lisa. Uh, he puts the helmet on to start the soul transfer. Uh, and he's like shaking her upside down as if he's trying to like shake her soul out as if it were loose change from her pockets. Or like it's like one of those bottles where like the, the yeah. your ketchup at the bottom's not coming. So you're trying to make it get to the bottom of the ketchup bottle faster. 
Bart is starting to become overwhelmed with guilt as he realizes that it's at least partly his fault. <laughs> but he grabs his wand and says, prank there, be Lisa's, undone. Lisa's wand. So Lisa's You're wand right. is the big he one. He takes Lisa's wand. Prank be undone. Destroy the evil one. And lightning strikes himself. And he's immediately like, hey, not me. <laughs> Help me, Bart. Not knowing what else to do, Bart charges Mr. Burns, and instead of using the wand in the way that Lisa would, he just stabs the dragon in the shin. Yeah, it's kind of like broken a little bit after the lightning strikes him. And honestly, it's very much like the first Harry Potter movie when the troll attacks in the bathroom. I think like Ron just ends up like stabbing it with the wand to like fight it off. It like stabs it in the eye. Yo, my enchanted shin. How did you know that was the source <laughs> of my power? The Burns dragon topples over and goes back to normal Burns. It forms. was a Horcrux. Oh. <laughs> oh, sir! In death, we shall together be, or we shall be together always. And Smithers <laughs> eats Mister Burns in a way that the commentary just wanted to say that there's definitely nothing about that scene that makes him think of anything else other than just a snake eating a person. <laughs> Oh, poor that Smithers. reminds me of there's a famous scene in Nightmare on Elm Street three, the dream warriors where Freddy's in like the snake form uh, yeah. and he's he, he's eating uh, Kristen, I think is her name, the main character in that one. Um, and basically, long story short, when they first did it, it was like the normal pink color that Freddy is. And as a snake, he looks so much like a penis that they had no choice but to change it. So they just covered it in this like weird green slime. To make it look less phallic, but it still very much looks like a just green slimy penis eating a woman. Uh, and this looks like Burns, as all like, penises do. wallowing Burns penis style. I don't know. I don't know how else to say it, Richie. I think we're I think we're in the clear on this episode, Miles. NC seventeen. <laughs> Nothing that we say in this episode is going to matter in the future. <laughs> it's all going away. Uh, so yeah. Smithers eats Burns. Lisa is like, Bart, let's stop this stupid rivalry. Even if you never become a great sorcerer, you're still an okay brother. Thanks, Lise. Now let's try to forget this nightmare. And as Bart and Lisa walk off, there's a leprechaun that comes back from the first uh, segment. It jumps onto Bart's back. Uh, and Bart is just like cackling away. It's the leprechaun's cackling away on Bart's back. Yeah. And the leprechaun turns the camera and shushes across the fourth wall. Uh, as we get a four leaf clover iris on the way out. That brings Ooh. us to the end of our third segment, but we're not done yet. We get a little extra shot with our guest stars because uh, Pierce Brosnan is coming out of the trailer in the Fox flat back lot, along with the leprechaun and the weird toad creature that was puking uh, <laughs> that Bart created one from each segment. Pierce is uh overcome with like the the treatment that they're getting from from the fox employee or from the the simpsons lot i guess we'll say yeah wow we really get to keep these fruit baskets well they used to give a champagne till somebody ruined it really? the vomiting. do they really think he'll do better with fruit and he does like little beep beep to get his car thing. And the leprechaun teases him like, oh, Mr. Movie Star gets to park right next to the stage. Look at the draw, I guess. <laughs> uh, can I give you a ride to your car? And they agree and they get in and they all ride off together. Pierce asks, why are they, uh, where are they, where are you parked? The leprechaun's like, oh, we don't have a we car. don't have a car. But I thought you. Just keep driving, boyo. Uh, and and then the, the car speeds off, off through the gates of the Fox lot and onto the traffic, uh, turning on the radio. And so the Gracie sound, we get a well, he says, sound. can I turn on the radio? Like he's, he's hijacking Pierce. But he's like, can I turn on the Being radio? Being polite about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we get a scream in the Gracie sound link. Uh, so this whole last segment was added because uh, they really like Pierce Brosnan and they didn't animate him and they wanted to. So that's why they oh, did it. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but that brings us to the end. Oh, uh, actually, I will say as well, the last thing from the commentary. The the Fox Studio that is actually dri uh, really really accurate the way they they drew that and that that nice. road and everything is like there's always shit traffic that you have to pull out on from the Fox lot and they like nailed it so uh, but that brings us to the end of Treehouse of Horror twelve Richie is there anything else that you or that book of yours want to point out before we call it a day um my mind exploded when watching this last segment because Reverend Lovejoy was in the audience watching the kids. 
and he's in a school of magic. And I'm like, is he just a minister of magic maybe in this? Because he looked like Reverend Lovejoy still. And I just couldn't wrap my brain around that for some reason. And oh, then funny. when they when Bart stabs Mr. Burns, he's holding Lisa and he's giant and he falls over dead. So theoretically, I'm thinking he should have had a dead man's grip on Lisa. He, his hand shouldn't have just opened up like it did. So Lisa should be stuck in that dead man's hand still to this day. <laughs> she should just not be a part of the show anymore. Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's Treehouse of Horror, so it doesn't matter next week. But yeah, considering people die in all these episodes all the time. I feel like Lisa's always the lucky one that gets to survive for the most part. I'm sure she's died at some point. We just don't remember, but surely she's uh, died at some point. Mm -hmm. oh, I guess the cafeteria where they're eating the children, they all fall into the blender at the end. Because they wake yeah, up from but, the dream. Right but she does. In. She does tend to be a survivor more often than not. But she's also smart it's as hell. So it kind of makes sense. Yeah, it's very appropriate. That. Yeah, that's all I have. The fallout, uh, fallout episode with Lisa as the main character. I would love to see that. Yeah. Yeah, that would be really fun to see. She's got the like bracelet thingy and like it's to to rock and roll. Uh, yeah. What would Bart be in that? We'll have to get there. He would be the the evil person that's like trying to blow up the town. I would like to see evil. Bart be the little like uh, the bracelet boy thing or whatever, like the the icon, like the the mascot essentially. Pip, oh, oh yeah, the Pip Boy. That's that's my my take on that. But like regardless, that. if that episode exists, we're gonna cover it eventually because that's what we do here on this uh, this podcast. We probably predicted it. I'm honestly super excited to be back. This is uh, season 13. We are starting to venture off, as we pointed out, some episodes that uh, we may or may not have seen. So that's gonna be interesting. But regardless, we appreciate you tuning in and listening, telling people about the episode, uh, donating on our Patreon, which you can still do at Best Darn Diddly. All of those things are super appreciated. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you guys. Yeah, don't be giving those random women on YouTube all, the, all your money when they don't do anything for you. Give it to somebody who actually cares about you. That's us. Yeah, and dude. You do care don't about Don't support us. only fans. Just support your only yeah. mans. Whoa. Yeah, there you go. And don't forget, you can also support Miles by following him at Mr. Most Days Off all over social media. You can support Richie, that's me, at the Wiz underscore Kid23. But more important than both of our powers combined, you can follow our show. That's at Best Darn Italy. That is D-I-D-D-L-Y. Richie and I will be back again. And next week, we are going to be covering the episode, The Parent Rap. And as with all our podcasts, it will involve betrayal and unspeakable evil. You're already sold. You're already sold. All right. <laughs> Until next time, be cromulent to each other.